ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marai Nagasu. I'm Dr. Mai Uchida, the director of the Child Depression Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital and assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Um, before I went, went to medical school and became a child psychiatrist, I was actually an amateur figure skater in Japan, very low level. But uh, shout out to my old coach, Misao Sensei, Oisashiburi desu, with Yuma Kagiyama. Um, so I am so excited uh, today to have the two-time Olympic figure skater, the team bronze medalist at the Pyeongchang Olympics, and the first American woman to land the triple axel at the Olympics, Mirai Nagasu! Yay! Hi, Mai. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so excited. So as many of you already know, uh, Mirai has been incredibly successful as an elite athlete, and she's also human. <laughs> human have both physical and mental health as part of their makeup. Both are complicated and intertwined. Mirai is here with us today to share her personal journey, which include great successes and also real and, and serious emotional challenges. Mirai and I are doing this video to shine light on the mental health of the youth, especially athletes and prodigies performing at the highest level, because this isn't talked about nearly enough, and because its impacts and concerns cannot be addressed if it stays in the dark. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to share my experiences with my own mental health journey, especially because I think when I was younger, I didn't have, I just wasn't aware that it was a big Thing. And so um, not knowing about what I could do uh, really impacted my life and career. And so I hope that by talking about it, others can um, figure out, you know, if they, they might need some help as well. It's wonderful. Well, let me start by introducing Mirai's incredible career. Uh, Mirai became the U.S. national champion at age 14. 14, Mirai. <laughs> yeah. At age 16, she placed fourth at the Vancouver Olympics with a killer Carmen program. In the following Olympic cycle, at age 20, while placing third at the national championship, she wasn't selected to be on the 2014 Olympic team. Um, many athletes may have given up at this point, but Mirai not only decided to go for another four years of training to aim for the next Olympics, but also she decided to, to gain a new superpower called the triple axel. She got back on the Olympic team at age 24, which is considered geriatric in the current state of the sport, and landed the triple axel at the 2018 Olympic Games. She was the only female skater to even attempt the triple axel at this particular Olympics, only the third woman to land it at the Olympics, and the first American woman to do this. She earned the team bronze medal and became the icon for redemption. Wow, Mira, you, you did all this. This was all you. It's really an incredible career you've had with the public successes as well as the public disappointments. And what strikes me the most is that the majority of your elite career was in your teenage years, starting from when you were only 14. And, you know, this is a time you know, where most kids are not even close to discovering themselves and, and are only starting to deal with social judgment and maybe middle school, maybe changes in relationship with their peers as well as their families. And here you were already on center ice alone and being literally judged by judges um, as well as commentators and spectators from around the world and also sitting in the kiss and cry booth while others watched you reacting to being judged. Like that's really hard to imagine, particularly as a teenager. What were those teenage competitive years like for you? At the beginning, I wanna say it was not easy, but it was definitely easier because I just was more like a sponge and I was digesting everything as I took it in and I was all about the experience and I was really enjoying it. But um, finances were always hard for my family. And so I was always expected to produce results because, you know, when you're producing results, it makes sense and you understand why you continue to be in it. But when you start to kind of dip down and have some bad years, that's when you start to question 
why you're still in the sport and why you're still continuing to train and spend a lot of money. Um, I learned very quickly that the higher I placed in my national championships, it they categorized me into an envelope. And mm. once you get into the top tier, that's where you get the most funding. But I went from being at the top of the tiers to slowly like, going down. And mm. it was difficult when, you know, there's that financial support from the federation. And so I know that how lucky I am to get that because a lot of skaters don't even have that, but mm -hmm. to have to qualify for it year after year, and then slowly starting to try to become a little bit more independent and understanding how much things were actually costing and then mm -hmm. um, being being expected to be able to produce those results so that I could continue to skate started to put a pressure on myself that I really didn't know how to handle. And at the same time, um, I was working with one of the best coaches in the world who, who had some hefty bills. Um, when I was, I want to say 17, my coach decided to move from um, Southern California to Palm Springs, which was quite a commute. Uh, and my mom particularly was really worried about my well-being and wanted me to stay at home, which now makes sense. So we started to commute to Palm Springs every single day. And um, I just couldn't train well after being in the car for so long. And I also didn't understand why I couldn't move out to Palm Springs a little bit, even though I knew it was financially not viable. It just... I felt like I wasn't in control of my own skating. So I kind of started lashing out at my parents because I was expected to still be so good at skating. But then I just didn't feel like I was being given the best chance and giving myself the right opportunity to train well. And so ultimately, my parents and I got to a point where we were not agreeing on anything. And they said, you know, like... I think I had turned 18 at this point and they said, well, legally you're an adult. So why don't you, you do, you do what you want. And they cut me off. I think that was when I really started to have to dig within myself to figure out why I was still skating. And so I had to get a job I, because I was literally cut off. And I remember waiting for my mom to take me to the ice rink and she just stopped taking me to the ice rink and I started taking the bus and it was like a two, three hour commute. And so I think when it was my decision to make that commute, I was much more willing to take that that commute rather than when it was forced upon me and I think that when I when I started to make those decisions myself that was when I gained a new respect for the sport and myself because I was trying to figure things out on my own and it was better for me when I was making mistakes and I understood where I was making the mistakes instead of feeling like I was not in control of those decisions. You know the developmental neuroscience research has shown that the human brain ha um, doesn't complete its biological development until our late 20s and, um, and you know I do think that there is something to say about how you and Yang the athletes and and some prodigies uh, are somehow expected to know what to do in these very difficult situations while our brains are still massively in development. Also, you know, for you, how you performed in the competition directly affected other adults who had stake in your successes, like your coaches, your agent, um, and the federation. I'm sure that that environment added more burden to your emotional well-being when there were people around you who were investing in you at stake um, for themselves. So, you know, considering that um, that young athletes' brains are still in development, as I mentioned, in developmental neuroscience, that's been proven over and over again. Um, and how these adults who have the stake in the kids' successes are in the position of often having power and responsibility over these athletes. I do hope that there would be more discussion surrounding how to support these athletes in their young years. Right. I mean, I had won the national championships and I only won 
one. <laughs> so I think that I started to, after that one, really start putting pressure on myself. And it yeah. kind of, um, when sponsors started to show interest and it was kind of that, oh, like if you, um, if you continue to do well, these sponsors will start to come your way. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, oh God, people actually care about my results and, yes. and really starting to kind of um, not perform well. And yeah. in another instance, I remember being in first place after the, the short program at the world championships. And I was competing against people who I had idolized on TV and just didn't know how to be at the top and didn't know how to handle going into the free skate. And even though I had been training well, I remember being told, okay, if you don't mess up too poorly here, you're going to become a world medalist. Mm -hmm. And then I went out and fell on almost every single jump in my program. It, I just started to choke and I, I just genuinely didn't know how to skate. And so I, I remember being so disappointed in myself. But in that moment when I was out there, it felt like I had two left feet and I couldn't even do jumps that I could do in my sleep. It was heartbreaking. Like I think I could oh, literally okay. feel my heart hurt when I wouldn't skate well and I would come away from it thinking I was a bad person because I was letting so many people down. And I don't think like weak or not strong enough or not ready, it, it, it's too simple of a summarization um, to, mm -hmm. to capture those moments. And I wish that more, more could go into those intricate moments. 